was the oldest of ten children. Mr. Blofeld and I corresponded for more than 20 years, and he even made a special trip to Paris to see me when I was a student. And when he was asked to come to the United States to speak, he told the organizers that I don't care where you send me, but you must send me to Atlanta so that I can see Mary Blackwell Diallo. And later he dedicated one of his books to me. I changed my major from music to French after my first year at UGA. And as a French major, I saw no opportunity to study abroad, something my other classmates did routinely. In graduate school, I realized that I would have to study abroad to become fluent in French. Again, unlike my mother, I was given the opportunity to stay abroad, study abroad through the assistance of Mr. Blofeld. He suggested that I apply for a scholarship that the French government provided to American students. When I received the scholarship from the French government in 1969, members of my family as well as members of my community couldn't imagine my going to a strange country all by myself. My mother was so upset with me that she refused to go to the airport. So my aunt and uncle took me to Hartsfield Airport in Atlanta, Georgia. My aunt always said that she cried once she saw me board the plane because she, did. she had no idea what would happen to me in France. I stayed in France after my scholarship ended and held several jobs in Paris, working at the Herald Tribune as a typist. I worked as a typist at Hearst Rent-A-Car. And finally, I taught myself speed writing and found a job as a bilingual secretary for a French shipping company. While in Paris, I met my husband, who was from Guinea, and I had my son, who was born uh, when I was living in the dormitories. Gladwell emphasizes the importance of these types of opportunities. He says that, before I go that, but Gladwell emphasizes the importance of these types of opportunities. And I believe that self-made should be changed to people-made, family-made, born at the right time made, history-made, and opportunity-made. Gladwell speaks to this issue, and he says that the lesson here is very simple, but it is striking how often it is overlooked. We are so caught up in the myth of the best and the brightest and the self-made that we think outliers spring naturally from the earth. We look at the young Bill Gates and marvel that our world allowed that 13-year-old to become a fabulous, to, to become rich. But that's the wrong lesson. Our, not rich, but uh, an entrepreneur. Our world only allowed one 13-year-old unlimited access to time sharing, to a time sharing terminal in 1968. If a million teenagers had been given the same opportunity, how many more Microsofts would we have today? Gladwell cautions us by saying that, quote, to build a better world, we need to replace the patchwork of lucky breaks and arbitrary advantages that today determine success the fortunate birth dates, and the happy accidents of history with a society that provides opportunities for all." End of quote. I would like to add that today students have more opportunities than many people in my generation and socioeconomic situation could ever dream of. I think about my very smart high school classmates who were not able to go to college because they couldn't afford the cost of housing at Fort Valley uh, college, Albany State College, Savannah State College. What if they had been able to attend the University of Georgia? Tuition at that time was $75 a quarter. Some males in my class and community did join the military to escape poverty. When I think of my experience at UGA, 
I remember the students, not just the other African-American students, Charlene Hunter, Hamilton Holmes, Harold Black, Carrie Russian, Alice Henderson, and Maddie Jo Arnold. But I remember many other African-Americans who came after us. There was a bond among us that was created by the situation of the 60s. But I also remember people like Ellen, a young Jewish student from Miami, whose car was not equipped with a heater because she said that they didn't need a heater in Miami. Once she and I drove to Atlanta on a very, very cold winter day and had to use blankets to keep warm. I'm forever grateful for two young men, both named James, young white men, who befriended me in spite of the problems it caused them. I remember a young woman from Holland who invited me to go to a cafe for coffee and was shocked when I told her that black people were not allowed in the cafe. Some painful incidents still come to mind. For example, in the beginning, I was always the only African-American student in my classes. And the first thing I noticed was that students tried not to sit next to me. In a large classroom, there would be no one on either side. <clears throat> in one class, I would just change my seat just to see the students scatter. <laughs> Another unpleasant memory that comes to mind is that my father and mother worked for a family in Athens, Georgia, and their son, Pat, played with my siblings and me. He ate at our house because he loved my mother's cooking. And even after my father stopped working for his father, my mother continued to work for the family. And my mother worked for, for his mother, and she used to uh, make clothes for me. But my mother, we, there were so many of us, and so I had to wear the same clothes over and over, and my mother washed a lot. But when I was in elementary school, and this came to mind this morning, and I couldn't get it out of my head, um, this, one of my fellow classmates, we were playing basketball uh, outside, and so we had to line up to shoot the ball. And she said, she sang over and over behind me, old dresses don't die, they just fade away, okay? <laughs> okay. Uh, so their son, Pat, and I had an English class together at uh, the University of Georgia. He never acknowledged my presence. Often he would be standing outside the classroom before class when I entered. He never spoke to me, and my, I was very shy. I didn't speak to him because I didn't want to embarrass him. My memories of my experience at Georgia are much more positive than negative. I had some excellent professors who supported my efforts when some of their colleagues didn't. For example, I had one professor, I was sitting in class and I was raising my hand and I was trying to get his attention and he kept ignoring me and I'm just waving. And finally he said to me, what's wrong with you? Do you need to go to the restroom? If so, get out. I was so shocked by his words, I left the room crying. However, he was reprimanded by the chairman of the department. I had mentors at Georgia who helped me to navigate the system. There were bumps in the road, financial problems, and housing problems, but I never gave up, and I graduated in four years. My humble advice to students is Try to take advantage of the opportunities that cross your past. Cross your past. Don't dwell on your mistakes. They are a part of life. When I was faculty senate president at Florida A&M University, I would tell my members often that I was glad that I'm human because humans are not expected to be perfect. Okay? One writer has said that perfectionism is a dangerous state of mind in an imperfect world. The best way to, is to forget doubts and set about the task at hand. If you're doing your best, you will not have time to worry about 
failure. Students, you are privileged to be in school. Think about those people and events that have given you the gift of opportunity and vow to become an outlier. Have the strength and perseverance to seize the opportunities as they come your way. Think about your uncle, your aunt, cousin, sister, brother, all of who gave you financial assistance or who encouraged you to pursue your dreams. Think about that teacher who refused to give up on you or in another case who told you over and over how smart you are. Think about that person who refused to let you be a slacker. Look around you, in your family, your community. There is much to learn. If many of them had had the opportunities that you have today, they would have taken full advantage of them. Do what they would have done. Do it for them. There are those who didn't take advantage of the opportunities of their time. Learn from their mistakes. Take advantage of everything Bainbridge College has to offer you, and I'm certainly you will succeed. Be inspired by those who have succeeded in spite of many hardships. Use your imagination to nurture your visions, and as one author has said, imagination lit every lamp in this country, produced every article we used, built every church, made every discovery, performed every act of kindness and progress, created more and more better things for more people. It is the priceless ingredient for a better day. You are the lights of hope for our society. Continue your hard work, and as you strive for excellence, please make the words global, international, world community, and interdependence an, an integral part of your vocabulary and your actions. Travel and seek educational, business, and cultural opportunities in the international arena. Remember, you are the future, and you will be successful only if you know how to take full advantage of the present. I would like to close with one of my favorite quotations from George Washington Carver. He said, how far you go in life depends on your being tender with the young, compassionate with the aged, sympathetic with the striving, and tolerant of the weak and the strong. Because someday in your life, you will have been all of them. Thank you. Dr. Diallo, thank you for your presentation. Audience members, questions for Dr. Diallo. Please make your, those of you who have questions, please make your way to the microphones in the aisles and we'll have a question. Dr. Diallo, you are a professor of French. Why did you choose French? Why did I choose French? Yes, ma'am. I started out as a, as, a, um, as a music major, as I told you. Um, and there was an incident at Georgia when I was practicing one night, and a young man came in with a hat on his head, a scarf across his face, a trench coat, and he had what appeared to be a gun, and, he, and it went bang, bang, and I'm screaming, and I'm screaming for a while, and then I realized that I was no, I had not been injured, okay? And so from that point on, the, the chairman of the department told me that I would have to practice in his studio because he didn't think it was safe for me. And during that time, I was taking French from a woman who was from France, and I was doing well in it, and I just said, why not? 